Absolutely uh, thrilled to welcome you to this uh, very important uh, Distinguished Leaders event with uh, Steve Nelson. Um, thank you all for uh, being here. Uh, we have a great series of speakers coming down the pike uh, after Steve, uh, some of whom you've seen uh, mentioned on the screen, um, culminating this season with uh, Mutar Kent, the uh, former CEO of Coca-Cola, who will be uh, here on May the 1st. Uh, so I just want to briefly uh, introduce uh, Steve, um, fantastic guy. Uh, he's been uh, very gracious to uh, uh, socialize with uh, many of us over the last 30 or 35 minutes. Uh, CEO of United Healthcare, um, a $180 billion division of United Health Group. Um, that means United Health Group, I think, is actually bigger than $180 billion. Um, number five on the Fortune 500 list. Um, United Healthcare serves one in eight Americans, uh, single largest business dedicated to health and well being in the United States. Uh, previously, Steve had many positions with uh, United Health. He's come up through the ranks, and uh, prior to being CEO, he was uh, the head of United Healthcare's Medicare and retirement business. I um, think it's worth mentioning a couple of uh, personal points and uh, it'll become very evident to you once uh, um, you see Steve alongside me on the podium here uh, that Steve is a triathlete and five-time Ironman fish finisher including the Ironman World Championship and um, I'm going to get off the stage pretty quick uh, when Steve comes up. Um, he uh, holds his master's degree in business and health services administration from the University of uh, Michigan, where he's uh, also serving as an adjunct professor of public health. Um, now, one other final point. I know from my sources up in the Northeast uh, that Steve was... Uh, giving a similar talk to tonight's at the Harvard Business School around about three weeks ago. And, uh, you know, this lecture series has gone from strength to strength, and it's so strong these days that our speakers actually have to do a dry run at Harvard uh, before, they, uh, before they feel ready for Miami, right? All right. So uh, without further ado, uh, let me introduce Steve. Thanks so much, Steve, for coming. Thank you. <clears throat> well, that, that was well done. I, I like the uh, dry run idea. Um, so I, I have a similar line, you know, when we talk to people. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know what it is about HBS, but when you say, hey, where'd you go to school? And they say, oh, you know, the school kind of in the Boston area. And you're like, I don't know why they all answer that way, you know, um, but, but I'm like, HBS, they're like, yeah. And I said, because you couldn't get into Michigan. That's, <laughs> so that's my, that's my line. Um, so great to be here. Um, really appreciate the invitation. Um, uh, I, was, I was asked to start just a little bit with an introduction, just my career and kind of background. Um, so been in healthcare for about 31 years or so. Graduated from Michigan, left Michigan in 1988. So been a while, seen a few things. Um, ironically, which we'll talk about a little bit today, is not as much change over the last 30 years in healthcare as you would have thought when you compare it to other industries, actually. That's my view, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But, but so have, have seen some, some uh, changes and some some movement, certainly demographic, and some macro changes, um, for sure, in our country. Um, I started with the uh, kind of, I, I, I really did have a, a passion for science and healthcare, but I also really enjoyed business and thought there was um, an opportunity to, to combine the two somehow. And I actually wasn't, didn't have a clear idea how that would work out. And, and then I learned that, um, not just doctors ran hospitals, and so I thought that would be an interesting way to spend your career. So that's really how I, what drew, drew me to to healthcare management leadership is the delivery system. And so I spent the first 10 years uh, with organizations like Henry Ford Health System in Detroit and Intermont Healthcare in, in Salt Lake. Um, then found my way to the 
publicly traded world of companies like United Health Group and um, other companies like this, um, and have had an unbelievable um, uh, journey. And um, it's one of those things where I, I talked to a lot of young people about what they're trying to do with their career, or where they're going, and I'm very grateful that I had a pretty strong um, idea of what I wanted to do, and I didn't. I had no idea I would end up in a role like this, but I, I had a, a, a vision of kind of what I wanted to do, and, and um, I'm very grateful that I've been able to be in healthcare this whole time. Um, just a couple quick, you know, and, and we can talk about this in the Q&A part too, but sort of three kind of lessons learned. We'll talk about leadership at the end, uh, a little bit more I'll weave back to leadership, because I think that is such a critical and missing component um, in most companies uh, and, and healthcare in general. I think we have more opportunity to, to, um, to, be, uh, uh, to, to have more young people come up into leadership positions in healthcare particularly. I see a lot of young leaders being attracted to other industries and, and we need more leadership in healthcare. Um, so I'll talk about that, but really there's three things that I kind of learned in my career that, that I, um, in sort of hindsight, I'm glad that, that I was able to kind of stick to this. And one is I was definitely willing to, to take a lot, to, to make a lot of moves. You know, not, not physical moves, but to have different kinds of experiences. They, they appeared to be random at the time, but they very much in my mind connected with what I was trying to accomplish, you know, long term. And so thinking about when I was at Henry Ford Health System, an opportunity came up to run the graduate medical education programs. That wasn't really in the vertical of running a hospital necessarily, but I thought, you know, it seems like that might actually be good to understand how clinicians are trained and educated and how that maybe plays into healthcare. And I'm a very, I'm in a very unique spot right now because I, I do understand how graduate medical education works and the role it plays on healthcare in America right now. Um, I wouldn't, that was, you know, for two years out of grad school, for example. Um, so other things like that. The second uh, lesson, this is to the, the younger folks in the room, um, you know, don't, do not be afraid to um, take the jobs that nobody else wants. You know, so the, the idea of taking a job that people have failed at or look like there's no upside, those are my favorite kind of jobs. Um, and, and I think, you know, you can, you can really learn a lot and you can make your mark by going to places that other people don't want to go. And then the last is whatever you do, make sure every day you're thinking about, I'm gonna leave this place better than I found it, no matter what. Um, and that could be incremental or it could be dramatic, but the idea to leave the place better than you found it. So those are the ways that, that I kind of think about some of the career choices I had. I often get the question, how do you decide? And that's kind of how we think about it, so. So speaking of taking hard jobs, um, um, I get asked the question a lot, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, as many of you in the room, you know, you're in sort of a social situation, any kind of situation, somebody will say, what do you do for a living? And you say, I say, I work for United Healthcare. And they say, what do you do for them? And I say, I mean, I, I weave and dodge for a while, and then eventually I say, I'm the CEO. And they say, why is healthcare so screwed up? <laughs> <coughs> and that's the rest of the evening. Um, and, uh, and so I wanna talk a little bit about that, um, and I don't want you to lose hope, because this is gonna be a little heavy at the beginning. We're gonna get the solutions. But there is definitely some, some issues. And a lot of you know this, but just to kind of lay it out there, we spend 145% more than other developed countries, okay? So we spend more. But we're not necessarily getting healthier. Um, and, and even in Florida, so, and I know a lot of you aren't from Florida, but here in Florida, spending has gone up dramatically over the past couple decades. And as I said, we're not really getting healthier. In Florida, we have more obesity, we have more issues in poverty. We have all kinds of things that are, are actually, it feels like it's growing. And, and if I put a lifespan um, 
stat up here, you can see it's not like we're living longer either. And particularly certain subsections of our population, the male African Americans, for example, are living shorter, fewer years than they used to. And so it's not like we're solving problems by spending more. And we're spending it differently than the other developed countries. So we spend about 80% of our 18% of GDP now on traditional healthcare. So physicians, hospitals, kind of how we would think about traditional. But yet 80% of our health is actually affected by things that happen outside of the hospital and the physician's office. Other countries do the opposite. They spend 80% on social services and about 20% in kind of traditional healthcare. And again, not solving the problem. Uh, in 2015, 30 million out of the 325 million Americans have three or more chronic conditions. Just in the next 15 years, that will almost triple. So people are not living longer. We have more chronic conditions. And so, and, and we're getting older. And so think about the 18% that we spend on 18% on, uh, of GDP on healthcare. That number is just by gravity going to grow. Make sense? So, and, and the pain is real. The, the amount of money that we spend on healthcare, kind of for the average American now, has become about 30% of their disposable income. And, and the rising cost of healthcare is outpacing individuals' income. So people are feeling it, and employers are too. Um, so we have, an interesting map that you could draw, and there's a lot of conversation about the uninsured, but we actually have a pretty good system, and it covers the majority of people through Medicare, through commercial, or through empl employer-sponsored insurance, or Medicaid, but yet we still have an unsolved, and not only uninsured, but we have um, a lack of access to good care, because if people are making a choice between prescription drugs or the rent or their premiums or rent, that's not good quality situation either. So they might technically be insured, but they still don't have great access to care. So you have this pain playing out pretty dramatically. We actually are, for me personally, I believe that healthcare is a right and that there should be universal coverage, which is different than single payer, but we believe that universal, universally Americans should be covered, have good quality access to healthcare. That's one of the reasons that I'm grateful I've been in this, this career and been able to contribute to that, and, and that still remains my personal mission. But the burden is shifting. So um, I guess with 2010, so not very long ago, the average kind of commercial uh, employer paid more than 10, about 10% more than, than kind of the Medicare fees. Now they're paying um, about 50% more. So the burden is shifting from the public private partnership sector and it's being subsidized by employers. And so employers, employers are kind of at the place where they're like, no more. And, and you know, they'll come to us when we bring um, premium increases to them, a company like mine will go to Ford Motor Company or something and they'll say, hey, you know, our number one line item to build a car right now is healthcare and we need that to stop. Uh, we, can't, we can't be competitive on a, on a, on a world stage. So there's a, a kind of an imbalance happening. Uh, so not only we're spending a lot, we're spending it differently and inside our system seems to be broken as well. We also have this dilemma where um, less than half of the healthcare practice in the US is not based on evidence. It's based on the way you were trained or tradition or sort of the local demographic or uh, local situation. It could be defensive medicine. There's a lot of things that drive it, but it's not necessarily based on um, evidence, which is troubling that costs more and it's worse outcomes. We also have a situation where we don't necessarily have alignment. I know there's a lot of great delivery system leaders here and represented, and I'm not being critical. It, this kind of happens across the system, 
that we just have, there, there are a variety of different stakeholders and uh, the, the incentives are just not aligned towards what I would call the three big things, which is lower costs, better outcomes, and a better experience. We all think about them slightly different and that's not helpful. Um, I, uh, several years ago, I, I hurt my back and um, I'm a relatively healthy guy and so when I have an injury like that, I, it, it worries me because I'm, you know, I'm thinking, is this it, am I done? You know, um, and so I, I did a lot of research, found um, this really well-known sports chiropractor in Minneapolis who specializes in non-invasive back, you know, and so I was like, I'm gonna go, you know, have a visit. And so I um, had this conversation and we went through a diagnosis, evaluation, everything, and I was sitting in his office and he was giving me his, his idea about how we're gonna solve this. And I said, and, and it was optimistic, he was optimistic, and I said, so how many times have you seen this and kind of played this out? And he says, thousands of times. I said, with what kind of results? Very good. I said, are you confident? Very confident. <laughs> and I was like, all right. He didn't know who I was. And I said, uh, would you be willing to, I don't know, guarantee that? I mean, it, would I get my money back if my back doesn't feel better, let's say, in six months? Sounds fair. Would you agree? I mean, if you're talking to your car mechanic, you're like, if my brakes don't work when I'm driving out of here, I want my money back. But he, his answer was not only no, but it was like, <laughs> no. You know, I mean, it was like, that's a ridiculous concept, you know? And I said, well, why is it so, you said thousands of times, and you said, I said, are you confident? You said, very. So why would you not guarantee? I mean, why are you not willing to do that? Uh, so I could come in here three times a week for six months, drop 65 bucks every time. I could walk out of here in six months feeling exactly the way I feel now, and I will have paid you that money, there's no recourse. And then I told him who I was and why I'm having this conversation. And I was like, it's an interesting dilemma we have. You know, I, as a patient and a consumer, I'm, my expectations are changing. And I'm, I'm hoping that, that the delivery system and the clinicians and payers and everyone will sort of change with our expectations. I mean, there's a bunch of companies now, no questions asked, you can just send it back. I mean, you know, you can wear shoes for a year and send it back and people give your money back, right? I mean, it's like, that is our expectation, but not in the healthcare field, which is interesting. So we have misaligned incentives. About, uh, I think you referenced HBS. So I was talking to some faculty there several months ago, actually, I was on the phone and we were talking about leadership, something completely unrelated to healthcare. And they were, and they, we kind of got into the healthcare conversation and they started talking about healthcare and they were referring to it as a wicked problem. And I thought, is this because I'm talking to people in Boston that they're saying wicked problem or is this a thing? You know, and so I, 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 I texted something you're not supposed to do when I'm on the phone call, I texted um, some, some friends to say, hey, is wicked problem a thing or is this just a Boston thing? And they text back and said, no, it's a thing. It's uh, Horst Riddle and Melvin Weber in 1973 coined the term wicked problem. And it is a problem that is associated with uh, societal issues, societal problems that seem to be unsolvable, that, that have a bunch of different stakeholders, um, no one accountability. If you solve one part of it, it pops up in another place um, and it just doesn't seem to be kind of making progress. And so you can put other things in the wicked problem camp, poverty, education, global warming. What? Climate change. Right, global warming, climate change, yeah, those kinds of things. And so healthcare is a wick wicked problem. And, and that's one of the reasons that I feel like I've been in this thing for 30 years and while I've seen other industries go to completely different places, I haven't seen us kind of transform in the same way. Would you guys agree with that, by the way? I mean, I'm being critical of myself too, you know, so, so we need transformative thinking. We need to be thinking about problems. We need to redefine the problems. We need to 
uh, bring d different kinds of solutions. That's why I'm so passionate about different and young leaders coming into the space. Um, so as I think about transformation, as I try to talk about it, and the, 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 the scale of transformation, I'm trying to think of an analogy I could use, and one was maybe the weather. And so I moved to Minnesota from Laguna Beach, California about six years ago. <laughs> and I like to spend time running and riding my bike outside. And this is literally what I would see when I'd go on runs in Southern California in the summer. Okay? In the winter, <laughs> interestingly, it looked the same. So I can't use Southern California as my weather transformation. But then we moved to Minneapolis. And this is our neighborhood um, in the winter. <laughs> this, yeah. That was a cheap shot. In the winter, uh, that big flat thing behind me is a lake. It's frozen. Right now, there's like trucks and houses and people fishing and stop signs. And I mean, like they plow roads on it. And, um, so it's, it's an impressive scene. But my wife and I, we moved there. We moved kind of into this scene. And we're looking at it, and we're like, you know, this doesn't come back. I mean, we know there's summer here, but I can't imagine this coming to life. I mean, it just doesn't seem possible. Um, but yet, so honestly, so it's March, what, 18th, 19th today? This is what it looks like right now. In less than two months, it's going to look like this. And I'll be water skiing. My birthday's on May 2nd. I water ski every year in Minneapolis on my birthday on May 2nd. I'm hopeful there's really thick ice right now, but it's raining like crazy, and it's like 50 degrees in Minneapolis, so water's melting like, uh, the snow's melting like crazy. But this is the kind of transformation I'm talking about. I'm talking about it looks completely different, and it feels different. And this, we're interested in. This, it's a special kind of person that likes this. Um, and there's a bunch of them that live in Minnesota. Um, but so this is what we're trying to do. So in our company, kind of our approach, and, and this could apply to, I think, anybody here that's thinking about healthcare. There's three ways that we're kind of approaching this transformation. One is to simplify and personalize the experience. The second is to modernize the approach to delivery, the delivery system. And then last, this idea of what does it mean to have access to care? What does that mean? Does that mean you get an appointment with a doctor? Or does it mean something else? So let's start with simplifying and personalizing. So our expectations are definitely changing. Would you agree as consumers? Clearly changing. Um, think about, and I could rattle off a bunch of examples, but just take open table, for example. There was a time, not very long ago, if you wanted a reservation for a restaurant, then you, sort of the best you could do is Google the phone number and you dial them, you get, you wait on hold, you, but, but you have to kind of do that a bunch of different times. Open table now, you can just say, I want to go to dinner sort of in this zip code or this neighborhood or this block and all the options come up and you can kind of pick whichever one, style, reviews, uh, accessibility, it's all right there, right? And in like two minutes, you're done. You have your reservation and you're on your way. I could talk about Spotify, I could talk about Netflix, I could talk about a bunch of different industries that have transformed themselves. Anybody been to Blockbuster lately? <laughs> How about even, nobody even wants to go, I mean, people still go to malls, I don't know why, but people do, but most people want to actually to buy their clothes on the internet. And they try them on, they don't like them, they send them back. You know, malls are kind of for a different experience, it turns out. Uh, so we are changing, but what's interesting is we're not really changing in the healthcare field. So whether you're trying to get an appointment with a doctor or you're a doctor trying to get, or a hospital trying to get an authorization from an insurance company to do a certain thing, it's a pain. Would you agree? I mean, it is a pain. Um, our case, we get requests for prior authorization 77 million times. 
90% of it's from fax or via fax. So we're actually changing that to make it more real time, more electronic. So now 40% of our prior, uh, prior authorizations are electronic and they, they happen real time while the patient is in the office or in the care setting and trying to reduce the number of fax. Um, so this is kind of how behind we are, but yet there are definitely solutions happening. And so trying to bring more electronic and technological advances to some of these old ways of thinking, physician, uh, patient scheduling, all those things are now becoming much more, you can call into one of our call centers and ask about a, a, a copay or some sort of typical insurance question. We get, by, by the way, we had a billion contacts a year. So we have opportunities to be more, uh, to, to create more simplification and personalization. And so when you call, we punch in your number and we, our databases start filling up on all the things that we know about you because of your claims and your lab tests and all these things become integrated through this thing called individual health record. And these are the kinds of ways that we're coordinating and then we can actually turn that information into actionable data that we can, that the provider can use to practice evidence-based medicine and make fewer mistakes, more effective care, or our call centers can actually help advise you and they can actually schedule a doctor appointment and even schedule someone to come pick you up. So this is the way things are, are changing. But it's, we're, we still have a long ways to go. Um, but this is revolutionary. We're gonna do this for 50 million people. Um, navigation. I have a 83 year old mom and she fits in the category of 40% of seniors have 40% have four or more chronic conditions, 40% live alone, okay? Navigation is what they need. I'm the CEO of United Healthcare. I have a hard time navigating the health system on her behalf. I mean, it's very difficult for me to do it. One, I don't have the time. Two, I'm confused about who to call, honestly, you know? Um, she says she has this, and I'm like, is that a gerontologist? Is it primary care? Is it an orthopedic surgeon? I don't know. I'm not sure, you know, what, wh where to start. Um, so she calls her United Healthcare number, and they help navigate her through the system and can make her an appointment. The other day I was talking to her. I, I took her to dinner. Uh, she, she, I live in Minneapolis. She lives in Utah. I, I see her about once a month or so. I took her to, on a date on Valentine's Day. It was awesome. Um, and we were just sitting there talking. She said, I was on the phone for an hour trying to schedule a doctor appointment. And the whole time she's talking, I think she's talking about she was on the phone with the doctor's office. And then I said, and then she said something that made me think that she wasn't. I said, who are you talking to? She says, I was talking to United Healthcare." <laughs> and I, I was like, that's my company, right? You knew, <laughs> you know that? And she's like, oh yeah, that's right. That is your company, um, you know. But but she was on an out on a phone with an hour with a navigator who's helping her schedule appointment because she just had a random. I'm trying to figure this out, and so she this navigator kind of helped figure out these are the steps. And by the way, the database is filling up, and through artificial intelligence is helping this navigator know what is the next best action for Dorney Nelson. So pretty cool. So digital engagement, also a huge opportunity. Um, digital is now health. Um, we need to have remote monitoring. We need to have ways to take all the data that we have and collect and organize it so it's actionable. That's what really Google is. You guys agree with that? I mean, they're really just an organizer of data. Um, and that's, we need to have that in healthcare um, so, but we need to have great access. We need to have tr more transparency. The data is there. It's about how do you organize it? How do you bring it? So this individual health record connecting directly with physicians and caregivers is really critical. We, we think of this as point of care kind of contact. We have a technology It's called pre-checked my script, pre-check my script. And we've 
uh, figured out a way to embed pres uh, prescribing information into the physician's workflow. So when, a, when they're actually prescribing, they have everything they need to know about the person's copay, about their insurance program, and then they also have clinical information that is this the best uh, solution? Is there a cheaper alternative? Is there, um, does, is there any other kinds of drugs that they're taking that might interfere with this drug? Those kinds of things. And physicians who use this uh, change their prescription about 20% of the time. 20% of the time. Um, by the end of 2020, 80% of all physicians that we work with, which is 1.2 million, will be using this kind of real-time point in care digital. And then you think about engagement from our end, we have, pro, we have a platform we call Rally, which um, helps to give you information, incentivizes you, uh, creates opportunities for you to make better health and lifestyle choices, uh, which is super important. We have a partnership with Apple Watch. Um, we call it United Healthcare Motion. People, United Healthcare members have walked millions and millions of miles um, because of this, and we've paid out millions and millions of dollars of incentives, and their healthcare gets better, and the costs go down when we do these kinds of things. So, these, this is kind of the what's going on with with digital now. Modernizing delivery. Um, now, I know there's a lot of people that have spent their life work in this room trying to figure out how to do this. I think we have made some progress, but not enough. Think about the transformations happening in other industries. Can you remember a time when, you know, when Little Caesar said, hey, we're gonna deliver pizza to your house, and you're like, like no matter where I live? I mean, how is that possible, you know? It's like, it's mind blowing. And, and by the way, if we're not there in 30 minutes, it's free. And you're just like, dang, this is, <laughs> right? do you remember this? How revolutionary this was? Now you can call anybody and go through Uber Eats and they'll have it in your door in 30 minutes. It kind of doesn't matter what it is or where it's from. This is transformational. Would you agree? I mean, this is kind of what we're talking about. This is my grandson, Bennett. Um, has four kids and seven grandkids. He's the youngest, actually. He looks pretty happy there. Um, that's because he has a s'more in his hands. He actually, you guys know what a s'more is? Okay. So uh, he actually has a double ear infection here. <clears throat> and uh, my daughter and um, her husband, they flew, we were having kind of a family reunion in the mountains in Wyoming, and they flew there with his double ear infection, and they had worked really hard to get um, antibiotics before they got there so they could kind of get things healing, but um, this is my daughter's version. Her husband forgot the medication. <laughs> <clears throat> and while we're all rallying around him trying to protect him from the wrath of that kind of mistake um, and how miserable it was making everyone else, she was trying to figure out how to get that prescription to a remote area in the mountains in Wyoming. What was interesting, there was a town fairly close by, and she said, so she calls her doctor's office and says, hey, I'm going to... There, I looked it up, there's a pharmacy kind of about 30 miles away, I'm gonna go there, just call it in, I'll pick it up, and they're like, can't do it. She's like, what do you mean can't do it? Well, because we need to see you again in order for us to write the prescription. And she's like, let me say this one more time. A kid has a double ear infection, you saw it three days ago, you prescribed antibiotic, I'm not getting any sleep. He's dying. I don't have a lot of options here. You know? They're like, yeah, sorry. So now some other people would say, like, well, you know, if they would have called us, we would have done different. That is kind of the routine right there. There's a lot of protection around if I don't see you, you know, and it's bacterial, so I, you know what I mean? There's like a lot of kind of situations there that kind of make that make sense but it's got to be changed. Anyway, finally she comes into my room one night and she's like, so do you know anybody? <laughs> we'll figure it out, you know? So we figured it out, but that's ridiculous that I have to kind of intervene to, to make that happen. Um, so there are opportunities. 
there's many of you who are partners with United Healthcare, and we work in uh, different ways to create a value-based arrangement. When we engage, when payers engage with providers in value-based, whether it's a accountable care organization or some other kind of value-based, across all the metrics, 80% of the metrics, quality metrics improve. So when the incentives are aligned and you're going for value, not volume, quality improves, which means costs go down, experience goes up. 54% of people surveyed would say, I don't wanna go to the hospital, I'd rather get care in my home, right? I mean, that is a absolute no-brainer. Uh, one in, I think, 10 patients right now in a hospital are getting a, a, a hospital-based infection right now. Um, and so that's not the ultimate setting. We, we are moving to alternative settings. There's a bunch of reasons for that. And I know hospitals are in the mix of this too, trying to figure out how to, how to transform. But so we are trying to create alternative, um, including virtual and more care at home. Uh, I met with the uh, CEO of Best Buy two days ago in my office. They are trying to figure out how to wire and homes and bring more care to homes with companies like ours. Cox Communication um, met with their CEO the week before. They want to do the same thing. Walgreens, they want to do the same thing. Everybody's trying to figure out how to move care from inpatient acute settings into less acute settings. Everybody's trying to do that. We're trying to do that, and we are definitely making progress. And when you do things like this, uh, again, quality improves, cost goes down. Now you have to have wraparound and a bunch of support, but you have to actually, you have to think differently about healthcare in the setting. Um, and so I know, again, a lot of you are thinking about these kinds of things in the room. But more information at the point of care. So I talked about pre-check pre my script. Point of care, more information coming into the physician's workflow. This is kind of what we're doing and this is what we're driving and this is happening more and more. So artificial, and people think, well, how do you use artificial intelligence in, in medicine? And one of the ways, very, just kind of reinventing old processes. So this idea of pre-authorization now becomes a decision support. So you ask, is this medically necessary? We say yes, but here's a bunch of information that will help you do it maybe even differently. And this is in your physician's workflow while the patient's in the office. So, and, and it's, it's, it actually can be incredibly powerful. Um, and then if you can align incentives to go along with that. So if you actually practice more evidence-based medicine, you get paid more. And we see that change behavior. Innovative product design. One of the things that's interesting about healthcare insurance um, is that there hasn't been a lot of innovation in the actual products. So we have high deductible, um, we have um, consumer directed, the words like that. But we really haven't done anything dramatic, you know, really a lot different than kind of shift the burden and try to create more, more um, uh, motivation to shop and compare and be a smart consumer of healthcare. Now we're actually introducing products that allow you to buy as you go. So you start with kind of a high level, and then as you need services, you can actually add um, old, old word, a rider, or some kind of a buy up kind of a product to help you deal with that episode, and then you can drop that and then move on. And those are the kinds of innovative products that we're trying to layer into the traditional base of insurance. And it's interesting because this, these, this kind of thinking is actually transformative and revolutionary. And if you talk to actuaries and people who are insurance science would say, I would have never predicted that we could do something like this. But because of technology and data and the artificial intelligence, all that kind of coming together, we can actually do this now. So that's gonna change the way consumers buy and use healthcare. So let me talk a little bit about access. There is, um, as I talked about in the beginning, 80% of our, our health is actually determined by things that happen outside of the doctor and hospital's office. And so, or the doctor's office and the hospital. And so 
why do we still think about if you don't have insurance, you don't have access to health care? That actually doesn't jive with that. And I'm not arguing that everybody shouldn't have access to insurance. But let me give you some kind of disturbing statistics. Um, we have 14.5 uh, million people that don't have access to stable stable housing, for example. We do talk about 28 million people who are uninsured, but we don't talk about the 15 million people who don't have access to stable housing. Um, 41 million people go to bed every night with food insecurity. 40% of the food produced in our country is wasted. 44.7 people live with mental illness. Um, I read a statistic this morning that said uh, one out of every 25 kid is dealing with some kind of serious mental illness um, that is probably undiagnosed. Um, one of the biggest drivers of ER visits right now is mental health. And so we have a um, problem in our country thinking about what do we call health care and how do we define it? So what I want to do is show you just a short video, it's just a couple minutes long, about some of the ways that we're thinking about this, and then we'll talk about it. This grant has opened up the pipeline with refrigerated semi-trucks and good drivers. We're able to get more food faster before it goes bad into people's hands, and this is good nutritional food. This is not a wealthy community, and it's been a big help, it really has. The, NBA guys the best thing about working with United Healthcare is they recognize that food is medicine, and so it's not just a one-time shot, it's not an inoculation. The sense of security, so we're, we're grateful for that. It's not uncommon, it's common. People can be made to feel hopeless. To be quite honest, I, I didn't envision I would be in this role. Because I was able to overcome, I could come back and talk to people who now are, you know, they're having the same kind of experience, and it's a vast amount of people. We have a lot of caring people who want to help. So the community health workers now can coordinate our patients getting in touch with those resources. Yeah, it makes me feel like I'm really serving a, a, a deeply meaningful purpose for helping to better the condition, the overall condition of people who live in this community. Thank you. Thank, thank you. I worked for a hospital for 24 years. I had good things, my kids, I took care of my kids, my home, you know, and then nothing. It was like, how did I get here? The most cutting edge technology in healthcare right now is an apartment with a perfect wraparound team delivered to exactly the right patient in the right way because it's curing homelessness and curing poverty for that patient. I had to have back surgery. I had to do a year of recovery and no driving and not being able to do certain things. And so I ended up being homeless for two and a half years. I was on the streets. If you don't have a safe place to lay your head at night, you can't even begin to heal. So I had just kind of planned I was gonna be on the streets for a while. And I was in shock when I got the call and excited at the same time and I cried and I just, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that it was all happening, it was mine, and that I was safe. That's a big deal. Really nice. So, this is what I'm talking about, thinking about healthcare differently. Um, we've invested about $400 million now on housing, uh, low-income housing, because it is medicine. And you can't just put somebody in a house, you have to wrap around services, support, training, education, you know, all these things. And then food, there's a lot of food banks out there, but they lack the ability to move food, fresh food. So refrigeration 
is key, for example. Um, this idea of there's a bunch of services out in the community, but they are not connected. Nobody knows what they are, they're underfunded, they're understaffed. By infusing um, community health workers into markets, we can actually change that. We do that a lot in Florida, actually. Um, and so there are ways to think about redefining what access to healthcare means. And we spend a lot of energy on a very narrow part and not enough energy on this big thing that actually affects how we think, how, you know, and, you know, and I think we all probably can relate to that individually and people we know. So it's gonna take different kinds of thinking um, to, to address all these things. I'm gonna wrap up here, but I think there's really two things that we need to do differently. One is we need to be willing to make some bold moves. So this guy is Alex Honnold. Have you guys heard of this guy? So he's in the movie Free Solo. Got an Oscar documentary. The reason it's a big deal is because he climbed El Capitan, which is a 3,000 foot vertical wall in Yosemite Park, California, um, in under four hours. But the big deal is he did it without a rope. And nobody has even, nobody has even, not have they not even tried it, they haven't thought about trying it. You know, and it makes sense. I mean, it's literally one mistake. And, and if you watch the movie, I've watched it twice. I have a climbing background and I've, uh, I've watched it twice, I know how it ends. And I'm hyperventilating, my hands are sweating, you know, and I know he lives, you know, so. But climbing requires people like this. I'm not saying we need to climb El Capitan without a rope, that's dumb. But we need to be willing to make some bold moves. Some do some things that have some risk associated with it. Might not work out perfectly, but we need to do some things that nobody's done before. Even other countries. We own and operate 55 hospitals in South America, serve six million people there. Um, we need to do things different all over the world, not just in our country. And then the last thing I'll just say is we need to work together. You know, we need to work employers, governments, hospitals, payers, physicians, caregivers, social work. We need to start thinking about things differently. We need to blur some lines. And I'm, I'm really passionate about this point. We need to blur some lines and stop kind of fighting for what's good for our business, but what's good for the patient, what's good for healthcare in our country. And we will come up with a much different answer. If we can blur, blur lines when we step back, we will have masterpiece. This is uh, one of my favorite paintings, uh, Venice and, uh, or Dusk in Venice by Monet in the early 1900s. He actually painted this, um, ironically, while he was losing his vision. But the, this idea of being kind of deliberately blurring lines to come up with something incredible is, I think, what, what we're aiming for. So those are my thoughts. Thanks for your, your time and patience. Uh, Steve, thanks so much, and especially uh, focus on the uh, social determinants of health and uh, United Health's broader view is very, uh, very instructive to hear. Um, we're going to take, uh, since we're a little late, we're going to take four or five questions in a row in a couple of minutes, and I'd love our students to uh, be uh, especially um, at the forefront of the Q&A. So get your questions ready. Remember, a question is a single sentence that ends with a question mark. Um, but let me, let me just start us off with, with a couple of quick ones, sure. if I may, uh, probably on uh, the minds of many people here. Uh, Medicare for all. Good idea, impossible. Didn't see that one coming. <laughs> uh, so again, we are for universal coverage. Yeah. Um, Medicare for all does not make sense to me or to us. And that's because uh, I, I, I don't see um, the government by themselves running healthcare successfully. I really think the private public partnership is incredibly powerful, brings innovation, brings different kinds of capital, um, it brings different kinds of leadership and innovation. So I really like that model and in so many ways, it's working so well. You know, so our view is we ought to, 
continue to strengthen the public-private partnerships and strengthen the platforms we have, manage Medicaid, manage Medicare, Medicare Advantage. These are incredibly successful programs. The employer sponsor insurance programs work great. Let's make those better. Let's expand coverage for some of those things. And let's get this right. Um, we do not think Medicare for All is a viable solution. Okay. How do you run a $180 billion company? Um, you know, I, I actually having had experience being in leadership roles of smaller organizations, um, it's not too different. To, I know that sounds strange, but there are super certain leadership principles that I that I believe in that um, apply to a smaller organization or a big organization. And I think it's about um, having a vision. It's about having a great team. It's about having a plan that connects to that vision. It's about relentless execution, and it's about communicating your vision. And so I think that applies to a variety of settings, and so that's kind of how we think about it. But I will tell you that having been a little over two years in the CEO role, my wife and I both um, agree that uh, during that time, I have felt my ability to kind of live a balanced life mm -hmm. significantly challenged in ways that it wasn't before that. And so. I f I'm not going to sit here and say, hey, you know, there's no issues, uh, super easy. Um, that's not it. But I do think it can be done, and I don't think it's dramatically different than a lot of roles that a lot of leaders have. Is there anything the U.S. can learn from what other countries do in terms of healthcare management? I think there's, there's a lot to be learned. Um, they all are challenged by the same thing, access, cost, and quality. All, it doesn't matter where you go. So it's the same issues. But I do think that um, the way that the government and private sector work together in certain countries is, is kind of powerful. Um, I do think there is, you know, for example, in, in Europe, there is much more, um, uh, there's much more resources and a lot more um, emphasis on primary care than on specialty care. In the US, it's kind of the opposite. I think that's a, a model that we could build on. I also think that um, mental health in other countries is lower than in the US. And I, I think it's because there's a lot of reasons, but it's resourced better um, in other countries, for you, you example. You mean mental health problems are Yes, are yeah, what did I lower. say? Lower, you just said mental health is yeah, lower. Yeah, right, mental health, mental health problems. problems, right, mental health problems. And, and it's, it seems to be handled at a lower <clears throat> cost, mm -hmm. you know, um, more effectively. So I think there's a couple things. The other thing, though, on the flip side of that, I think as a consumer of healthcare, as an American, we have a different mindset around what we expect. Um, and the uh, net promoter scores for people that are in the UK that get their care through the NHS mm -hmm. are incredibly high. Yet, they wait a year to get elective procedure done. You know, and, and we would freak out you know, yeah. if that happened. Yeah. And so this idea about what are we willing to tolerate and kind of deal with in, in the US is, is comes <coughs> into play too. All right, let's, uh, let's open it up. And first of all, let's uh, see who our students are who are here. Put your hands up. Uh, we really appreciate you coming here tonight. Thank you very much. Um, so let, let's take the, uh, uh, who's, who's got a question? Yeah, the lady on the left here. Please bring the mic down to the fourth row. And what, what I'm going to do is uh, ta I'll take four questions, and then Steve can answer them um, uh, as he wishes, OK? So just briefly, your question. Thank you. First off, I want to thank you for coming today. Um, to your point about healthcare lacking um, in innovation as compared to other industries, I was just kind of curious in your thoughts of what uh, of your thoughts of blockchain and kind of like how that can revolutionize the way that patients, insurers, and um, hospitals kind of communicate. Okay, great question. Let, let's take a few more. Um, uh, let's take. That's my second favorite question now. Okay. <laughs> We'll take the uh, gentleman here on the uh, corner. Hi, uh, my name is Vinay. Thank you again for coming today. Um, so my question would be, how, how would IHR be implemented? Would that be something that physicians would be able to access through EMR systems and, and how that would be integrated so that physicians could access that information? OK. Uh, gentleman with the red tie.
anyone who wears a tie gets my vote. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Nana, and thank you again for being here. Uh, my question is, uh, as the CEO, how would you define population health, and what do you see uh, health system's role in that definition? Okay, let, let, let three great questions before we forget them. Let's go. take okay. those three. So blockchain, um, we are investing and participating in blockchain, actually in partnerships with other, with our competitors and delivery systems. Um, I think, first of all, blockchain is not very well understood. You know, so I think you, you kind of have to start with what is it really? But the idea that um, it can create more transparency and more connectivity is powerful and there's something there. So, so I think there's a lot of kind of pilots and, and exploration going on right now, okay? Um, IHR, we start with, um, um, we're rolling it out slowly, we're trying to get to 50 million, all of our United Healthcare members, and we've actually, we're talking to CMS, we'd like to do it for everybody. But the idea is starting with um, a few delivery systems and embedding it in their EMR. Um, one of the biggest challenges to doing this kind of expansively is the interoperability mm -hmm. and the lack of connectivity between different EMRs. And again, this idea of blurred lines, they don't want to work with each other. Mm -hmm. you know? And so we have to break through that somehow, and we have thoughts about how to do that, but that's going to be the challenge. And then population health, kind of interesting question, because when I was sitting in Michigan in the mid-'80s, people were talking about population health, this is what we're going to do, and vertically integrated systems, and you know we're going to and right now, if you Google population health, right now, today, while you're sitting here, it will kind of be described as sort of a new idea about how to manage populations. And the, so the interesting thing about population health in the last 30 years or so, we, we, we haven't really realized the promise of population health. And one of the reasons is because I think we've lacked the data and the way to make the data accessible about these populations and lack kind of high tech, scalable intervention um, methods. And so now how I think about population health is not just, um, and a lot of people would kind of start thinking about it as prevention, and actually think about it as intervention around a certain kind of population with a condition or a geography or even an age group. You know, so you can define it in a lot of different ways. You can apply it as an employed group. You can apply it as the state of Florida. You know, there's a bunch of ways you can think about it. But it's about taking, capturing data on that population, having the means to intervene, and then connect them to the right kind of care, which could be housing. You know, so that's how we think now about, that's how I think about population health. And it has to be a holistic, whole person approach, or it doesn't make sense. And tertiary intervention is actually, in some ways, more powerful than prevention, because that has a 40-year tail. But right now we're in a crisis, and we need to be kind of about intervening in the critical times. And so, not that we can't do prevention, we, we need to do that, but so that's how I think about population health. So, um, you know, among the various players in the healthcare system, uh, insurance companies have not always been the most trusted uh, by consumers. And you've been very open and candid tonight about how sometimes the, the industry fails its uh, customers. Yeah. Um, how do you, what are the two or three things that you think you need to do uh, most in United Health or the health insurance industry to rebuild consumer or patient trust? Yeah, I, so, uh, so I, I agree with you that there's opportunities I'm going to come back at the end and give you a bunch of examples of why it's not quite as bad as you know you you, you might have been led to believe. Um, but but part of it is um, taking the data that we have and using it to help providers make practice better medicine and help consumers live healthier lives. Our mission is to help people live healthier lives and help the health system work better. So if we can do that, and and what I mean by that is is can we take some of these old models? You know, prior authorization, for example, is administratively burdensome and is complicated and is frustrating. And so can we take that and reimagine that to be a decision support 
can we bring data to help physicians practice better medicine, ease their burden? Can we help patients have a better experience? Um, can we take the call center experience? And our call centers now, they, don't, they aren't measured by average handle time, which is how you manage call centers, by the way. We've changed it to issue resolution. So we don't measure how fast you get off the phone. We measure what's the NPS score of the person that just you hung up with, and did you resolve their issue? Our Medicare Advantage call center people, by the way, we take care of 13 million seniors, wear buttons that say, I save lives. Because they're taking their question and then they're getting them to their screening. They're getting, ordering them a, a ride. You know, those are the kinds of things. So I think if we can continue to be a consumer-oriented healthcare company with solutions and, and be a really good partner with providers, you know, and, and get rid of some of the adversarial kind of interaction that, that we've had for a long time. I think that would be powerful, you know, back to blurring the lines. Right. All right, let's take a few by, more. By the uh, way, Medicaid yeah. and Medicare have as high of NPS scores as Disney, Interesting. interestingly enough. So. Wow. All right, uh, gentlemen in the middle, we'll take uh, three more um, in a row. Thanks. Hello, hello. Hi. First of all, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Appreciate you sharing what you did. Um, I'm sure uh, you have the idea of being accountable, of uh, being a, you know, an, an athlete, a triathlete, of course, and, and I'm sure we all look up to that. So um, being that we should all be accountable, I see that you guys are doing that partnership with Apple or something about that. So um, I wanted you to possibly elaborate on that and see how we can look forward to being healthier Americans. Okay. Um, let's take the gentleman here, if we could uh, bring the mic down, and then we'll go over to the uh, back to uh, Scott. Yeah. Hi, I'm Eric Chang. Um, do you see the model of Americans getting their insurance through their employers changing? Because as more people try to start their own businesses or go into the gig economy, that's one of the barriers mm -hmm. I think about. I work for a large company. I think about that a lot. If I want to try and go into consulting or start my own business. Okay, and then uh, Scott on the far left. Yeah. I think some of our students have class now, so uh, that's why they're leaving. Uh, thank you again for coming tonight. Um, given that we are in a business school, I was wondering if you could touch on the differences between your MHA and your MBA and how the combination of both has uh, uniquely suited you to tackle the issues you're tackling currently. Um, so the first one was Apple, yeah. Um, so <clears throat> one of the things that, so I'm, I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. So that question is a really great example of um, something that kind of frustrates me, actually. And, and reason, you're like, hey, so you're doing something with Apple, so healthcare is going to get better. I, I know you didn't say it like that, but... Le that's kind of where sometimes you sort of get the Amazon says, hey, we're getting into healthcare, and everyone's like, awesome, you know? Well, what are you doing? Well, we don't know yet, you know, but, but it's awesome. Whatever it's going to be, it's, you know. And, and so one of the things that we have to be careful about is, is we can't nibble around the edges. You got to be all in, you know? So us and Apple, Apple Watch is just kind of the beginning. It's about, again, how remote monitoring, how do you use data? How do you make it accessible? How do you make it actionable? And that's kind of what's going on with Apple right now. And so we're just this whole idea of motion and heart rate and things like that um, are just kind of the beginning of this whole world of using technology differently to inform our healthcare lifestyle. And so it's, it's very broad. It's Dexcom and it's Cox and it's Best Buy and it's Apple and it's Google and it's Microsoft, and, you know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's real actually, and it's SAP, it's Salesforce. I mean, that's, those are the kinds of partners that we're working with, and it's, it's actually gonna be really powerful, but n no, the nibbling around the edges approach is not gonna solve our problem. We gotta get in and take care of Medicaid families and the underserved and, you know, not, not all the places that people love to go. So that kind of leads me to the employer question, uh, or the uh, commercial. I think, I think you're going to see, first of all, it's a very, very strong platform for healthcare. It works great. Most people, the vast majority of people, are very satisfied with their insurance. In fact, a lot of times people get jobs 
100% so they can have health care insurance. And so it's a pretty valuable commodity, and, and um, employers are going to continue to use it, I think, actually as a way to incentivize and compensate and reward employees. So I think we could see it getting stronger, um, but it's too expensive. And so I go back to my earlier conversation. We have to reimagine it, the model, and kind of break that down in order for employers of all sizes to be able to uh, offer it. So um, in terms of the difference between business school and school of public health, actually, that's a very interesting, um, I could talk about that for a long time. We'll try to be brief, but just to, the setting, the Ross School at Michigan, School of Public Health, when you go to the Ross School, um, it's like, you know, super hip and and tech, you know, and glass and you know it's you know, I mean it's 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 like looks like Google or something. It's you Steve know. Ross. It's Steve Ross. Yeah, you know, you go to the School of Public Health and it's linoleum, you know, it's like <laughs> kind of beat up. You know, the classrooms are not that. You know, like the stuff doesn't work and you know, and no one's names on the building, <clears throat> um, and. And so there's a different, and so it was interesting. So I started, I, first year at business school, and then my second year was at School of Public Health, and my last year was kind of both. And I remember being in the, you know, the business school, and we're doing you know, the case study approach at Michigan, and we're sitting in a room, we're kind of doing this thing, and then we go to School of Public Health, and, and it's like, and, and I would go to check out a book you know, or something, and somebody, would, they'd be like, oh, this book's checked out. And I'm like, well, how do I get it? And they're like, I don't know, somebody beat you to it. And it was like super competitive, you know, and, and everyone was trying to, everyone was going to consulting or drug manufacturers or tech. When I go to school of public health, everyone's like, hey, do you want to study together? Let's help each other out, you know. It was, it was very cool, actually. I'm like, and everyone's nice and kind and helpful and want to save the world, and it was, it was really great. Um, but what was interesting is then as you got to last year, you start combining. And, and you find that, <clears throat> unfortunately, our education system is driving some of the problems that we have, which is you have a certain kind of people who think publicly traded, greedy, bad, you know. And the entrepreneur, you know, the capitalists are like, school of public health, it's, 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 it's endearing, but it's not gonna help, you know. And, and there's, sometimes there's these kind of divides, and, and I really, and I feel it a lot of times, by the way. I've been on both sides. I've, I, I sit with governors and public health officials, and I, you know, do, and, and there's a, and, and it's, you know, when people are on the, you know, when they're talking about insurance reform or beating up on a company like United Healthcare, my kids would be like, Dad, why do you work for those guys? You know? I'm like, because you seem like such a nice guy. You know, I'm like, I, this is, my team is a bunch of people who have dedicated their life to try to fix healthcare. You know, and, and you go to the, you go to Henry Ford Health System, the same people. You know, so it's, I think we need to lose some of the labels and kind of mix, and so we're trying to bring people into United Healthcare from public health, from tech, from public accounting, from finance, from delivery systems. You know, one of our top, who is my Baptist CEO? Right, so a guy, the guy who runs all of our delivery system relationships came from Baptist, for example. And so blurring those lines, I want to see more of it. And honestly, what I, what I did was incredibly valuable because I see both sides of it. All right, I think uh, we'll, we'll end there. Steve will be around for a couple of minutes to uh, answer any questions uh, at the front of the room. But I uh, want to thank you again, Steve, for uh, sharing with mm -hmm. us tonight. And, uh, Wish you every success. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. The uh, oh, traditional so Miami uh, Cafe Cito mug. <laughs> 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 we just want, need a quick photo with that. If you could, yeah.